Cuddy. It's not as cold as this hat may lead you to believe. It's just that I lost my beanie. I wore that beanie a whole lot when it was freezing here in Texas. And uh, I did my laundry at the end of it because it was starting to smell funky. You don't need to know that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I lost it in the laundry. So, uh, okay. So I'll, before I start talking about today's topic, I want to make some personal reflections on this whole series that I'm doing. And if you want to skip all that, I'll, I'll leave a timestamp in the description so you can just go to the subject of this post. But anyway, I started this whole thing to uh, help me speak more fluidly. Um, I have trouble sometimes finding my words, um, keeping my train of thought while I'm talking. I pause a lot. Sometimes I say the wrong word without even realizing. I didn't know I did this until I started watching these videos, but I'll use the wrong word and not even realize that I've done it. And... Um, but sometimes if I can't think of a word, I'll, I'll come up with a substitute word that doesn't necessarily capture what I was trying to say. And um, so basically, I just have a really difficult time taking what's in my mind, translating it into words, and then saying it. Um, so I started this series to try to get better at, at just speaking. And I have this problem not just talking, it's worse speaking in front of a camera or a microphone, but I even have this problem if I'm just having conversations with people. Um, and it gets worse if the conversation is an argument. So uh, so anyway, through the course of um, doing these videos, I think I'm in the 40s now, maybe 44, or 45, something like that. I've gotten a lot more comfortable speaking in front of the camera. But just from watching some of the videos, I don't know if I've gotten much better. There have been a, a, a couple of videos, two or three videos, that I thought went pretty well. Other ones were pretty rough. Some of them were so bad that I would just have like a brain meltdown in the middle of the video. And I would stop the video and I would delete it. And I would start again either, either later that day or I'd try again the next day. And so... I don't really think I've improved a whole lot in my ability to speak fluently and to find my words and stuff. So I mentioned a few videos ago that uh, I had been Googling around about my issues and I came across the word aphasia. And I started reading about aphasia and then I started worrying that I have it. Well, um, I still think I may have aphasia. Um, I acknowledge the possibility that I'm just one of those people that when they read anything on WebMD, they think they've got it. But uh, I've watched some videos on aphasia, and I've watched other people speak, and I just relate with a lot of it. And so now I'm worried that I have aphasia. And I think there's like five different causes of aphasia. Most people, it's like they had a stroke, or uh, I don't remember what the, I don't remember what all of them are. But uh, I haven't had a stroke. Um, one issue that has me concerned is, uh, it, it didn't happen all of a sudden either. Um, with a lot of a head injury, that's the other one, stroke or a head injury or something like that. Neither one of those have happened to me, so it wasn't an all of a sudden thing. It was a gradual thing, and I can I can think as far back as 15 or 20 years ago, and when I've been in situations where I couldn't think of a word, and it would just be a mundane word. Like one time, I was I was going for a walk with my brother, and I was uh, talking about cars, but I could not think of the word car. I thought, you know, vehicle, vessel, moving thing, but I could not come up with the word car. And that was like 20 years ago. But um, it's gotten noticeably worse over the last three years. I think it's just gradually gotten worse, but just over the last three years, it's like gotten noticeably worse. And so, uh, so there are two things that uh, have me concerned. One is the possibility of like dementia. <laughs> And I, I'm still relatively young, but I'll worry about dementia. Uh, the other is a brain tumor. It could be like a really slow-growing brain tumor or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me. But if it's true that I have aphasia, then probably this whole video series or doing things like this are not going to help me. And that's really discouraging to me. Um, the best I can do, I guess, is just get more comfortable with it and deal with it. Maybe just laugh it off. It's, it's really it causes me anxiety knowing that sometimes I say the wrong things and people don't understand 
people get the wrong idea about what I about what I mean because I use the wrong words. It's not their fault that they got the wrong idea. Um, sometimes I'll just completely leave out the word not, and that will completely change the meaning of wh what I'm trying to say, but I won't realize that I left out the word not. Um, so another thing is that, uh, as I think I come across as being stupid, and this this bothers my ego a little bit, because if I'm, if I'm talking to people and it's like a, an intellectual conversation or, or anything like that, I'm going to come across as being stupid because I, I just sound like I'm bumbling and, and I can't come up with my words or whatever. And that makes me, that stresses me out. It embarrasses me. Um, and I think probably a lot of people do think I'm stupid. Uh, I used to think that people thought I was stupid because I had social anxiety. I used to think that this, you know, at the beginning of this video, I called myself the introverted Christian partly because I thought that that was part of my problem is that, you know, not only am I introverted, but also have social anxiety. And I kind of attributed this inability to speak to my social anxiety. But now I'm starting to think that maybe the social anxiety is not really it. It's probably, it's possible that the social anxiety has exacerbated the problem, but I don't think it's the root cause of the problem. I think I got aphasia. I think there's something wrong with my brain, basically, which maybe it means I am stupid. I don't know. Okay, so that's enough about the personal stuff. I'm going to talk about the subject now. Um, the subject today is the existence of Jesus. Did Jesus even exist? Whenever I'm writing a book, actually I'm writing three books on uh, Christianity that's going to contain a lot of the same information that this uh, series that I'm doing, this talking series I'm doing, but it's going to be a little bit better documented because I'm not going to be doing it off the top of my head. And it's going to be more organized and stuff because I'm writing. I write much better than I speak, but uh, it'll contain a lot of the same information. Where was I going with that? I have lost my train of thought. We were talking about, oh yeah, yeah. So I remember what I was going to say. So, um, so I was really hesitant to include a chapter in my book about um, the existence of Jesus because it would be kind of like if you were a biologist and uh, you're writing about the origin of life and, and the evolution of life through the eons and you decided to include somewhere in the book um, a response to young earth creationism. Or something like that. Well, most people would think, why are you wasting time talking about young earth creationism in a serious book on biology? That would be to give it more credit than it deserves. You probably, if you were trying to have it published by an academic press, you probably wouldn't be able to get it published just for mentioning creationism. Um, so I kind of, you know, had the same feeling about talking about the existence of Jesus because, uh, if you talk about it, it seems to lend it more credence than it really is warranted for having. But on the other hand, uh, Jesus mythicism has become really popular on the internet. I remember I got an email from somebody that I knew a really long time ago, and they had watched Bill Maurer's um, religious documentary. And I guess I haven't watched it, but I guess he talked about Jesus mythicism in there expressed doubt about Jesus not existing. And so she got on the internet and she found this article on this webpage called about.com. And it made it sound like Jesus really didn't exist because, you know, Jesus was just borrowed from pagan myths or something like that. And, and she was genuinely wanting to know what I thought about whether Jesus exists. She said, she said, I think this is just the nail in the coffin of Christianity for me. And so there's a lot of people out there that really take it seriously. Um, but, you know, in the academic community, it's, it's not really an issue at all. And so I guess I, I decided to include it because I'm not writing for an academic community. I'm writing for the people, you know. And so, uh, so if this is an issue for the people, I think it should be addressed. Um, but I just wanted to put that disclaimer on there because I don't want anybody to get the idea that because I'm addressing this, that it's a serious issue among, you know, scholars or people who are in the know. Um, so let me, uh, just go into, uh, some of the arguments for the existence of Jesus. Um, one of the arguments is, is just simply the fact that in all of our sources, Jesus is always placed in a historical context, a very specific one that was in the recent past, you know, Paul and everybody existed between 33 and 66. 
and Jesus is placed during the time that that uh, Pontius Pilate was procurator of Judea. Well, that was between the years 26, no, yeah, 26 and 36, I think he was procurator. And Jesus was crucified by Pontius Pilate, and all of the, all of the earliest sources are unanimous about this. And so it seems like in, in everybody in the New Testament attributes the origin of Christianity to Jesus. Well, there's a bunch of other religions out there. Um, there's Buddhism. There's, uh, well, what's that? What's that religion called? Uh, Baha'i. There's Baha'i. And they've got Bahu Allah. Um, Mormonisms have Joseph Smith. Uh, so you got all these different religions. Lao Tzu is the founder of uh, Taoism. And nobody doubts there. There's no reason to doubt the existence of, uh, of Gautama Buddha or Lao Tzu or Joseph Smith or um, Muhammad. You know, the most natural, parsimonious, obvious explanation for the origin of these religions is that the founder existed. And so in Christianity, that would be Jesus. So, I mean, that should be the default position is that Jesus existed until we have good reason to believe otherwise. So that's one reason. <laughs> Another reason, if you happen not to be a scholar and you get all your information from experts, um, remember when I was talking about epistemology and I was talking about how most of our knowledge comes from experts, you know, like most of our knowledge of science, the fact that the earth orbits the sun, just basic stuff like that. We ourselves did not do the research. We're relying on scientists, people in, in the know. And so we can make these appeals to authority if we ourselves are not experts. Well, it turns out that there's a near unanimous consent on the existence of Jesus. It used to be that there were no scholars that doubted the existence of Jesus, with the sole exception of Robert Price. And Robert Price had not published in um, any academic material on the non-existence of Jesus. He always published that stuff for a popular audience. And uh, I'm not trying to poo-poo the idea of mythicism. Well, let me rephrase that. I kind of admire what Robert Price is doing because one thing I like about Robert Price is he doesn't care about the status quo. Um, and I think that if that if different fields of, uh, of um, study are to move forward, there need to be novel ideas from time to time. If Copernicus hadn't come along, you know, well, somebody would have figured it out eventually. But I mean, Copernicus kind of kind of bucked the system. He came up with this novel idea and everybody was skeptical at first, but now it's the received, everybody agrees with Copernicus, the earth orbits the sun. Uh, the same thing is true with Einstein's relativity. That was brand new when he came out. I don't know. I don't think many people doubted it when he came out because he, he has pretty good arguments for it. But through the years, it's been proved. Same thing with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics are pretty weird when it first came out. So I'm not opposed in principle of somebody like Robert Price or Richard Carrier coming along and coming up with a really creative argument for the non-existence of Jesus. I don't have a problem with that. I think that's great that some people do that. Um, but in this case, I don't think those arguments went out because uh, just because they haven't convinced anybody in the scholarly community. The whole scholarly community seems to just... And Richard Carrier, I think, wrote the first peer-reviewed book arguing that Jesus didn't exist or arguing that it's improbable that Jesus existed. But it hasn't convinced very many people. I don't know if it's convinced anybody. I've heard some talks on YouTube where people will say, yeah, there's like five scholars now who think Jesus didn't exist, whereas a few years ago it was nobody but Robert Price. But I don't know who those five scholars are. But there are thousands of scholars all over the world. There's actually a stronger consensus on the existence of Jesus among scholars than there is um, a consensus among biologists about evolution by natural selection and uh, a random mutation in natural selection which is kind of crazy if you think about it. There would be a stronger consensus on the existence of Jesus among experts than there would be about, about uh, mutation and natural selection as the mechanisms for evolution among biologists. But it's true. Um, so anyway, if you're a non-expert, it seems to me that just based on scholarly, the strong scholarly consensus that uh, we have good reason to think Jesus existed. 
If you're a scholar, of course, that argument's not going to mean anything because uh, they're all your peers. If they're, they're your peers, you know, you have to look at the arguments. But apparently they have looked at the arguments. They're all still convinced Jesus existed. Um, another one is just explanatory scope. If you adopt Jesus mythicism, you have to come up with all kinds of ad hoc explanations for the evidence. You have to dismiss a lot of it. And a lot of Jesus mythicists do this. They'll say that this or that passage is an interpolation, or they'll have some really harebrained interpretation of some passage that's beyond the obvious. Um, but the most, I mean, just the existence of Jesus explains in a simple parsimonious way why it is that we have Christianity, why it took the form that it had, you know, they're claiming that he's the Messiah, that he was crucified, um, and, and all this stuff. You have the Gospels and everything. Um, the, exist, the real existence of Jesus explains that stuff without having to come up with all harebrained ad hoc explanations for all the various aspects of Christianity and all the various statements made in the Bible and stuff like that. Um, so that's the third reason. A fourth reason, and this is honestly my strongest reason, is the fact that, you remember in the previous uh, video, I was talking about Messianic expectation. And notice in that Messianic expectation that I uh, talked about how the coming of the Messiah was supposed to be accompanied by a reunion of Judah and Israel and an ingathering of all 12 tribes, you know, back to the land. And the Messiah would sit on the throne of David and he would drive all of the enemies of Israel out, all the occupiers, all the oppressors, they would be pushed out, and uh, there would be worldwide peace, all these wonderful things that would happen, and Israel would, would dwell in peace and prosperity and, and all this kind of stuff. So this is who they were saying Jesus was. He was the Messiah. He was the one supposed to usher in all these things. But instead of all that happening, instead of Jesus prevailing against Rome and against Israel's occupiers, Instead, he was crucified by them. Now, that's totally counterintuitive because, uh, because I mean, in every other case of a Messianic movement, once the leader got killed, the movement ended. Because, And that makes sense because if, if, if somebody claims to be the Messiah and then gets killed, that's kind of proof that they're not the Messiah, especially if they died without having ushered in all these promises that were supposed to happen. If Jesus was killed without ushering in all these promises, there'd be no reason in the world to think he was the Messiah. And yet, um, if Jesus was made up, not only did they make up the claim that he was the Messiah, but they also made up the claim that he was crucified. And this is, I mean, this problem is exacerbated by the fact that crucifixion is a is public humiliation, basically. You remember in the well, you probably don't remember this because you're not old enough, but back in the Middle Ages, they'd put you in these stocks, you know, in the middle of town, and they'd throw fruit and vegetables at you, and this is supposed to be a public humiliation. Crucifixion is kind of like that, only worse. The Romans made crucifixion uh, a public spectacle to, in order to discourage revolutionary movements. The, the, crucif the whole purpose of crucifixion was to maintain the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and so it was a punishment that was especially meted out to revolutionary type people and people that, you know, cause stirs and raise people up in revolt, things like that. You remember Spartacus? Spartacus was crucified and all the slaves that revolted with him, there was just mass crucifixions. Um, so the same thing with, with Jesus. You know, Jesus, we're saying that he's the Messiah and he was crucified. Um, that would have proved to anybody that he was not the Messiah. So if, if, if people want to start a religion about a would-be Messiah and they want to promote this guy as being the Messiah, the last thing they would say is, guess what? Instead of prevailing against the Romans, he was crucified by them. So the fact that the crucifixion is part of the Christian story, it seems to me, is, it makes it pretty certain that Jesus existed because they would not have included that in the story if he didn't exist. Or if they wouldn't have made that up. Um, it seems like if they were going to make up a death, they would have at least come up with a heroic death. You know, maybe have him die in, heroically in battle or something. But uh, instead they have him die in the most humiliating war way a criminal can be killed. Public, public crucifixion. Um, 
So that seems to me to, to make it virtually certain that Jesus existed. I'm, I don't have any honest doubts about it. I mean, I've, you can doubt things to the degree that you can doubt that the external world exists. You know, that kind of doubt is possible. That's just mere possibility. But historically, I don't think that you can reasonably doubt Jesus existed in light of the crucifixion. Um, another one that's almost just as strong is the fact that they said Jesus was from Nazareth. Now, if you remember in the previous thing, I mentioned some prophecies in, in uh, Zechariah and Micah, and I think it was, I can't remember if it's Zechariah or Micah, but in one of them it says that the Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem, which makes sense because David was from Bethlehem. So, of course, the Davidic Messiah has to be from Bethlehem. But they all said Jesus was from Nazareth, called him Jesus, from Na Jesus of Nazareth. This is in all four Gospels. So if you remember what I said about, about independent sources in a previous video, you've got Mark, Q, and John. So three sources, if you want to go with the two-source hypothesis, all say that Jesus was from Nazareth, even though... Now these Gospels, they weren't writing in, in ignorance here. They all knew that the Messiah was supposed to be from Bethlehem. In John's Gospel, there's an incident where some people raised objections. How can Jesus be the Messiah if he's from Nazareth? Isn't the Messiah supposed to be in Bethlehem? Well, John doesn't even answer that um, in his Gospel. Matthew and Luke both do answer it. They both come up with a story in which uh, somehow Mary and Joseph end up in Bethlehem and Jesus actually gets born there. So the Messiah is, he fulfills the prophecy. So Matthew and Luke... And John obviously all knew that the Messiah was supposed to be from Bethlehem, and yet they insisted that he was from Nazareth. So that's another situation. If they were just going to invent a Messiah, why not call him Jesus of Bethlehem instead of Jesus of Nazareth? The fact that they call him Jesus of Nazareth, knowing that this creates a problem, um, suggests that, I mean, Jesus had to have existed. Uh... I guess another argument is that um, it's just the fact that, you know, remember when we talked about the genre of the Gospels and how the genre is historical and, and Paul wrote, writes historical stuff. Paul places Jesus in a historical context. He says Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, that he was a descendant of David. David was a real physical person. To say he was born under the law is to say that he's a He's a Jew, and to say that he was born of a woman is to say he's a human being. So Paul believed he was a human being, and um, and so you got that, and there's there's a few other details Paul gives about Jesus. Um, in the Gospels, the Gospels, remember, are um, ancient biographies, and just by the nature of the genre, typically the person they're writing about is somebody they at least believe exists. Um and especially in the case of Luke, you know, who claims that he looked at earlier sources and he's trying to write a chronological account of what happened. And he writes the book of Acts, which is basically part two of the same story. And, and in there, we know there's historical information in there. And so, um, so that's another reason to think Jesus existed, just because of the, the genre that he, that he shows up in. Um, another reason, and this is a pretty strong reason too, is the fact that, uh, Paul was personally acquainted with Jesus' brother, James. He met James. And Paul mentions also that uh, Jesus um, had other brothers. Mythicists try to, try to say, well, this must be um, brothers in the Lord or something like that. But that's, not the, that's kind of an ad hoc um, explanation that doesn't really fit the context of the way it's true that christians are sometimes referred to as brothers they refer to each other as brethren and stuff like that but here paul makes distinctions between the brothers of the lord and other christians and so the brothers of the lord don't refer to christians generally they refer to a specific small group of people and the fact that their name, James, we know James was one of the brothers. Well, that shows up in the Gospels, too. The Gospels also that Jesus had a brother named James. Um, and it mentions other brothers, not like Judas. Um, I can't remember. Not Judas the Apostle. He had another brood, brother named Judas or Jude. Uh, and I don't remember the others. He also had sisters. He had a mom and sisters and stuff like that. But... Uh, 
But James, the brother of Jesus, also shows up in Josephus. There's two passages in one of Josephus' books. I think it's the Jewish Wars. I don't remember off the top of my head. One of them has an obvious Christian interpolation. And this is one where, you know, he talks about how Jesus was a wise man, and if ever there was a man, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, that one has some obvious Christian interpolations. And if you want to push it too far, you can say, well, that calls the whole thing into question, so we can't use that as evidence. Most scholars don't do that. Most scholars think that there is a core that is about Jesus, but some Christian went in there and edited it. But the one about James, that one's not as controversial. I mean, that one seems to, it fits the context and everything. It looks like James was a real person. And what that one's about is... Um, there were two prefects, I guess. One of them was Albinus. Uh, one prefect, uh, I guess, went back to Rome, and while they were waiting on the next one to come back, I think Albinus was on the way, the Sanhedrin met together, and they decided, we need to get rid of this James character. And so they threw him off a, they threw him off a wall or something. I don't remember. But uh, So Josephus mentions James, too. So we know this James existed because he shows up in these multiple sources. So... If Jesus had a brother named James, or if this person named James existed and had a brother named Jesus, well, that suggests that Jesus existed. I don't think you can get much closer than that without Jesus himself having... If Jesus himself ever wrote anything, we'd all probably question... The big question would be, did Jesus really write that? Um, but uh, we have a first-hand account of somebody named Paul who is personally acquainted with a, one of the, at least one of the brothers of Jesus. James. So uh, so for all those reasons, it seems like there's, we have ample evidence to believe that Jesus existed. Um, so I guess that's about all I have to say about the existence of Jesus. And so next we can go on and, and talk about what we can know about Jesus from the sources that we have. And uh, I'll do that in, in another video. Thanks for coming.